Hey, this is going to be a short kind of review on a couple of things that are important that I'm not sure have made it um, as a clear message. Levels of measurement. The idea, um, the differences between nominal, ordinal, and numeric data. Um, numeric data, obviously anything that can be counted, like people or barrels of oil, or measured, like temperature or income. So um, you do need to think when you're using numeric data, you need to be able to um, and tell, answer for yourself whether or not you should be normalizing or standardizing your data because it does affect what kind of map you can uh, make. So nominal data means like a name. Think about it like that. These are completely equal um, descriptions, unrankable categories, inherently unorderable, like um, soil types, land use, state names. They're just different kinds of things. And then ordinal data means they can be ordered, but they're not quantitative. Um, it's not a continuous numeric value. So small, medium, large, low risk, medium risk, high risk. That's ordinal data. From the midterm, it wasn't clear that everybody was comfortable with these, um, with these descriptions. Okay, so talk about standardizing data. What is that? It's the idea of taking a raw count and creating a rate or a ratio from the count so that you can compare different places more equally. And the reason this is important uh, is because thematic maps can present raw counts, but you have to be really careful not to associate it with an area. So when we talk about making choropleth maps, you have to use uh, standardized data, normalized data, because you're filling in the color of an area uh, and the area is going to kind of drive where those numbers come from. We need to detach it. So we need, when we're standardizing, we're talking about um, like how dense, population density, um, you know, counts of something per 100,000 people, something like that. Like imagine comparing Canada population to Switzerland's population. Um, Canada has more people, but it's way, way bigger. So it has a much lower population density. And you would lose that if you just showed, you know, the population um, in a choropleth map. So if you're showing magnitudes, you definitely want to use a total or a count. But if you're mapping relative differences between places, stick with standardized or normalized data. And like I said, choropleth, choropleth maps must use standardized data. No raw counts, no population totals with a choropleth map. How do you know? Is my data standardized already? It could be. Look for units that say things like per capita or percent or a ratio of x to y or a rate. Um, the most common ways to standardize are to divide the data by the area of the enumeration unit, like by the county or the country, um, or divide the capita by the number of people that are within the enumeration unit, so per capita. Okay, so what's the point um, for data classification? Data classification is really important, and I kind of touched on this um, a little bit earlier in an earlier set of slides, um, but I want to dig into this a little bit more. Um, if you have a huge number of observations, sometimes it's overwhelming to just, um, you know, kind of account for all those things on a map. And I'll show you some examples <laughs> of unclassified choropleth maps. But, but we can organize and simplify data by putting a huge number of observations into different classes. It makes the data more easy, more easy to understand um, and helps clarify the message on the map. So the data needs to drive the type of classification that you choose um, because you want to be really careful not to create false patterns. So we are generalizing when we classify, um, making small changes, simplifying the data and you know grouping it one way or another can really have huge effects on the look of the map and what it means. And this is one of the easiest ways to lie with maps because we do assume the default many times. And you'll sometimes look at a map and not question um, how the data were classified. The main goal of classifying data is to make sure that you are um, 
maximizing the difference between classes and minimizing the difference in the values within each class. So you wanna make sure you're grouping similar observations together and then split apart observations that are very different. So you might have a set of values like 1.3, 1.6, 3.5, 3.9, and the obvious place to break this would be between 1.6 and 3.5 because these are more similar, these are more similar, and then there's a bigger difference between them. And that would be a natural breaks kind of uh, classification scheme. But this big paragraph right here, you can ignore it. What it's saying is um, you have to take meaningful breaks in the data seriously, and that should trump the kind of classification scheme that you're putting on. If 1.5 is a critical value and anything above that means one thing and anything below that means another, then you have to drive a class in between these two values, and that would be legitimate. So obviously let the data drive what you're going to do. Okay, how many classes is the right number of classes? Rule of thumb, after much study, anywhere from three to seven. It's up to you. Anything more than seven, it uh, overcomplicates, and anything yeah, less than three is a little bit too, you're just losing too much information. More classes equals less generalization, which is a good thing, but more classes means um, it's harder to tell them apart, and that's not a good thing. Okay, here's an example, price of hotel rooms in Chicago and a histogram, right? And then um, what I wanna show you are the different ways that we could break that up, the different ways we could classify it. And if we could be in class together, we'd run through exercises where you guys take your own data and experiment with this a little bit and do it manually. So an equal interval is going to divide the data into equal class sizes. So nice clean breaks in your legend. That, loves, that looks lovely. But this really only works with data that's fairly evenly spread across the range. So a histogram that's just very consistent, doesn't have a major peak, no major outliers. Um, if you have data that's skewed, uh, you don't want to use equal interval because you're going to produce empty classes, and that's silly. Okay, uh, quantile. Quantiles make really nice looking maps because you end up using the whole um, stretch um, of the color in your color sequence, but um, you can often have um, very different values in the same group. So if our goal is to put like values in a class, you can see here we've kind of broken that down. This little observation should be uh, classified with this group, but because we're trying to get the same number of observations in each class, uh, it's been broken down differently. We've split this group that clearly makes sense together. We've split it in half. And here, this guy is being um, clumped in with group two, and it sh clearly should be with group three. So you have to be careful with quantiles. They look nice, but they don't always make sense. And then natural breaks is considered sort of the optimal uh, classification scheme. It's usually created with um, algorithms that look for um, those natural groupings. And then we talked about geometric uh, last time, which, which takes this one step further. Um, but anyway, yeah, the problem with these is that it's so arbitrary that you can't apply the same classification scheme across um, different data sets. So it's harder to make comparisons and it's gonna change every time you have a different uh, distribution of the data. Uh, and what was the other thing I was gonna say? Um, well, I can't remember. Anyway, okay, that's it for classification. Th those were just some topics I wanted to make sure we covered one more time quickly. Um, if you have questions about these, please let me know. Thanks.